Good morning, everyone. Um, as your vice chair who's sitting as chair today, uh, if we could get started shortly, that'd be great. Well, good morning, everyone. As you may have noticed, I'm not Kristen Wong Tam. Uh, she's otherwise occupied, which I will explain at a, well, shortly. I want to welcome everyone to the meeting today, both the committee members, uh, members of City of Toronto staff, and to the members of the general public and deputants. Uh, you can follow the agenda and the debate on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council if you wish to do so. Uh, the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee uh, wishes to acknowledge at this time the land that we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations. Those include the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Toronto is now also home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We are also acknowledging today that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And as a person of Métis ancestry, I wish to thank my ancestors, Chimigwich. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act for any of the proposals forward today? Uh, if any of you as members need to declare an interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, or MCIA, you are now also required to file a written declaration with the clerk. Uh, the clerk's staff have forms here if you need to do so either today or at any other meeting. So um, next up um, is a proposal to confirm the minutes from our last meeting, April 11, 2019. Could I have a motion to do so? I see motion from Michael Michelli. All in favor? Carried. Uh, the first item on our agenda today is the chair's report. Uh, we also will have a deputant uh, on this item, and um, Alan will be speaking after I've read the highlights version of Kristen's notes. once I get them. All right, Chair's report. Uh, Kristen, as always, has had a busy period. Um, Kristen uh, attended the Toronto for All campaign launch, feeling left out on April 25th. She spoke at the seventh uh, Toronto, Toronto for All campaign launch, excuse me. The uh, launch highlighted access issues faced by persons with disabilities. And the event was held by the City of Toronto in partnership with the Centre for Independent Living. Uh, Kristen on April 25th was also at uh, TTL Taxi Drivers. Uh, she met with representatives um, from the drivers group to hear their concerns regarding the City of Toronto's current accessible plate licensing regime. A follow-up meeting was held with municipal licensing and standard staff May 13th. Uh, Toronto Public Health Cuts, uh, the next item. Um, as you all know, that following the provincial government's announcements regarding cuts to public health, Kristen's participated in multiple press conferences, uh, along with fellow councillors, to express opposition to the new funding schemes. Thank you for that. Um, at the May 14th, 15th meeting, a City Council voted to require building owners and operators to maintain a list of volunteered contact information, identifying tenants who may need assistance during building evacuations or temporary shutdowns of vital services. And that, of course, affects um, people living with disabilities that are the focus of this committee. That's why that's being brought up. Uh, Variety Village, on May 21st, she met with Variety Village to discuss the expansion of recreational activities in the City of Toronto for persons with disabilities uh, and with their support, the support of Variety Village. Also, she discussed at that time the potential for an employment placement program at the City of Toronto for Variety Village members. Uh, Kristen also attended various flag raisings and proclamations. 
On April 15th, uh, the neurodiversity flag was raised over the city of Toronto uh, to raise awareness of neurodiversity. The ceremony took place at 11 a.m. Uh, Special Olympics Toronto uh, Invitational Youth Games Week uh, was May 14th to 17th, and the city of Toronto raised a flag to commemorate the Special Olympics Ontario Invitational Youth Games Week. Uh, next, the city of Toronto proclaimed myalgic encephalomyelitis, and chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and multiple chemical sensitivities awareness day. That took a couple of breaths. On May 12th, 2019. Um, next, on May 14th, the City of Toronto proclaimed Apraxia Awareness Day. On, and apraxia, for those of you who do not know, is a motor speech disorder that makes it difficult for children to speak. Upcoming and ongoing consultations. Uh, the City of Toronto is inviting comments on housing, uh, specifically affordable housing, long-term care homes and services. Um, there's a public consultation that will run from March the 29th to July 1st, and that is ongoing. There is one addendum to the chair's report. Um, the chair is happy to um, announce that she and her partner, Farah, have given birth to a healthy, happy young child and the child's name is Kian. So I think a round of applause is in order. And we do, uh, oh, yes. I forgot that we must also introduce everyone in the room. I know most of you, so I forgot. So before we move to uh, a motion for this, let us introduce everyone in the room, starting with myself. Glenn Hart, the not usual chair of this meeting, but one of the two vice chairs of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. And let's proceed around the table to my left. Deirdre Boyle, Accessibility Consultant. Hi, my name is Michael McNeely, and today is my first meeting. So I am from Kingston, Ontario. Hi, my name is Karima. I'm a member of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Hi, my name is Miranda Frey. I'm from Toronto District School Board, Next Steps Employment Centre. Liv Mendelson, I'm a member of this committee. Michelle Grimley Petridis, I'm a member of this committee and I'm with Community Living Toronto. No, okay. Um, Good morning, my name is Jason Michelle. I'm a brand new member of this committee and uh, very excited to be here. Thank you. Okay, Michael Michelli, and I'm a member of this committee. Hi there, my name is Wendy Porch. I'm a committee member and I'm the executive director at the Centre for Independent Living in Toronto. Hi, my name is Darren Cooper. Um, I'm a member of this committee. This is my first uh, meeting, but I am a former committee member serving on the last term and I currently work at Ryerson University as the accessibility project manager. Good morning, I'm Carol Kostinen. I'm an administrator with the city clerk's office and I help provide meeting support for this committee. Good morning everyone, I'm Jennifer Ling. I'm from city clerk's office. I'm the committee secretary for this committee. Hi, Lynn Genova, I support your committee and this is still my favorite committee, especially when we have a, a new uh, dog on our committee now. James Martin with the City Clerk's Office. I support your committee. Good morning, Katisha McGregor with the City Clerk's Office. I too support your committee. Good morning, Shigithi Dave Indran. I'm with Transportation Services and I'm presenting at today's committee. Good morning, my name's Lorene Bodium. I'm with Parks, Forestry and Recreation as an advocate for people with disabilities. Hi, Yin Brown, Accessibility Consultant with People, Equity and Human Rights Division. Mark Kim, Project Manager for Accessibility in AODA with uh, Yin Brown and Deirdre. Elizabeth Glibbery, I'm Director with uh, Municipal Licensing and Standards Staff. Marcia Stoltz, Manager, Vehicle for Hire, Municipal Licensing and Standards. 
Nagin Chemchuri, I'm the manager of policy at Municipal Licensing and Standards. Mazen Aribi, 2019 ACAD Chair. Putting up with my slight miss of uh, timing on that. As well, welcome Councillor Fletcher, who's hiding behind Michael from my angle. 2019. So, um, we also have a speaker to the Chair's report, and I would invite them to come forward this time to the appropriate spot, and I would ask you to introduce yourself at that time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alan, and I'm here representing Checkers Taxi. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. As I said, my name is Alan Matrasoff. I'd like to thank the chair and the committee members for giving me the opportunity today to discuss uh, the issue of on-demand accessible transportation in the city of Toronto on behalf of Checkers Taxi. Uh, Checkers Taxi is a family-run brokerage with over 30 years' experience. Our focus has always been on accessible taxis and private transportation. Currently, we are the only brokerage in Toronto with a 100% fully accessible taxi fleet. Uh, from 2014 to 2018, we have provided uh, 1.5 million trips, uh, and it's important to note that not one person had to identify that they needed a special, any special assistance on this trip. They just requested a taxi, and we provided service. Um, the owner of Checkers Taxis, Alex Matrasoff, um, his accolades and awards address his dedication in accessible transportation. Uh, he has been recognized by the Lieutenant Governor, David Onley, and was awarded with the Lifetime Achievement and Humanitarian Award by the International Association of Transportation Regulators. Uh, over the past few months, I've presented and participated in MLS public consultation meetings. I met with councillors and their staff, sat down with the chair of MLS and executive committee members. I've spoken with various stakeholders, organizations, and disability rights ad advocacy groups. In each meeting, there was one common concern, the lack of on-demand accessible transportation and training in Toronto. Uh, the proposal I'm about to pr uh, present follows a similar path the city uh, took in 2014, uh, which was to make all taxis in the city accessible. The difference between now and then is rather than forcing the drivers to make the transition from sedan to accessible, we're encouraging them. Uh, the three points go hand in hand that I'm in, in this presentation, so if you have any questions, please, at the end. Um, they kind of all come together. Uh, so the first uh, point is um, a taxi brokerage 2.0. Uh, this brokerage is an inclusive design brokerage. Uh, we'd like to ask the, the city to create a new classification or designation brokerage that is recognized by the vehicle for hire in uh, bylaw in the city of Toronto. Uh, the new taxi brokerage is 100% inclusively designed transportation service in taxi brokerage 2.0. This means that all vehicles in this brokerage are 100% inclusively designed with operators that are sufficiently trained. Um, as long as uh, we encourage any brokerage to join this, and that's the push of this, is to have more brokerages be 100% inclusively designed. As long as uh, a new or current brokerage meets the requirements, they could obtain this designation. Uh, the requirements uh, and suggestions include, but are not limited to, a number of vehicles in the brokerage a percentage of total number of on-demand vehicles outside of contract work, technology and training. Um, the second point of uh, this present, uh, in the presentation I gave to all the stakeholders and uh, committee members uh, is uh, incentivizing and promoting 100% inclusive design service business. Uh, this proposal is a no-cost solution to the city. Um, right now, the industry's concern or the owner-operator's concerns are the cost of vehicles are too high. We have heard from many uh, possible solutions by MLNS to address this issue. One of them uh, is that the city could cover the cost of conversion. That would help lower the cost of the vehicle's conversion. Uh, this money would be coming from the accessibility fund and uh, that the city has been collecting since the introduction of ride-sharing services. Uh, we believe this is a short-term fix to the issue. Uh, we believe that the accessible fund should uh, be given as a handout. Uh, sorry, a hand up, not a hand out. By that we mean the fare could be given to the riders by lowering the cost of the fare 
Uh, this will increase business to the drivers and it will lower the ride for the end user. Um, our proposal comes again as a no cost solution to the city that has longevity. It has, it asks the city to support and increase business traffic by making brokerage 2.0 its preferred taxi transportation provider. Any, and by that I mean any transportation contracts such as hospitals, wheel trans, nursing homes can only be awarded to uh, brokerage 2.0 fleets. This is a supply and demand approach that will encourage more owner operators to invest in accessible vehicles. We are asking the SIT that MLS have flexibility on the number of accessible taxi plates issued. That is to say that if a broker can demonstrate that the demand for accessible vehicles are high, that MLS release a series of accessible plates to meet that demand. This will help control the demand service we have in the city. Uh, my third point is um, a, a, a grassroots approach. Uh, so outreaching to surrounding municipalities with an AODA, AODA decal. We are asking our city councillors to join and work with other municipalities and allow inclusive design vehicles from Brokerage 2.0 to obtain an AODA permit uh, that allows them to pick up outside of the city limits. Uh, this also creates an excess, uh, a reliable uh, transportation to and from the city because surrounding municipalities don't have uh, the an adequate amount of accessible vehicles. As of the time, if you could just Sorry about that, but you understand. Uh, in conclusion, our proposal is a feasible, no-cost solution that benefits independent owner-operators, the riders, the city, AODA compliance, and promotes accessible transportation across the border and increases on-demand taxi service. Sorry to cut you like that. It's just uh, the timing is bad, and I think that we need to thank you for that information. It's very important. Uh, does anyone from uh, the committee have any questions? at the moment. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. Jason. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your presentation. It's really covering an area that we think is important. Uh, just a question on the number of brokerages. So your proposal would be that this new um, system would be set up and how many brokerages do you think realistically could, could apply and could, could be part of this, uh, this new entity? Thank you. Uh, any brokerage can apply as long as they meet the requirements of number of vehicles, adequate training. Uh, we're not, we, we actually encourage more brokerages to apply to meet this demand. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Now, I was a bit lax in who was next. It was someone over here and Michael. So we'll, Michael and, and Wendy, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of quick questions. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about inclusive design in terms of, you know, because uh, pe different people have different understandings of what it means exactly and if you've consulted. The other thing too that I was going to say is I did participate uh, back earlier this winter when the um, MLS was doing the vehicle for hire bylaw review and one of the issues that came up was about actual insurance that even though if you make everything fully accessible, um, a lot of the driver operators are finding that their insurance costs were way too high and we're sort of making that suggestion that perhaps the city could cover that cost. Uh, yeah, to uh, address your first um, <clears throat> question, um, what we mean by inclusive design, right now um, inclusive, what we're including as inclusive design is um, TT, what, what covers with TTL plates, so a ramp, um, seating with benches, um, web clamps be regulated in the vehicles. Um, we're also open to suggestions and creating a groundwork for a conversation of what else might be included. Uh, when I met with stakeholders, we spoke about um, different needs from different groups. And uh, so it's really an open approach that we're taking uh, to this uh, solution. Um, and for your second question, uh, insurance. Insurance right now is at an all-time high. It is very difficult to get insurance. Um, but the reason for it is because we, they need trained drivers. And uh, if the city were to, if the city were to help the brokerage 2.0 create, uh, generate business, this would cover the insurance uh, concerns that the operators have today. 
So again, the idea here is to create a revenue stream for the drivers to cover their costs and uh, earn an income. I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. And Wendy. Thank you for your presentation. I have a few questions. I'm just gonna say them all and then you can address them as you see fit. Um, I wanted to know uh, what would be the role that checkers would play in the new uh, structure? Um, how would, how do you envision, maybe this isn't something that's been thought out yet, but uh, what is the complaints mechanism in the new structure? So if there are complaints from consumers about whether or not a brokerage is providing 100% accessible service, where do you envision that being uh, managed? And where has this idea been presented previously and what kinds of responses have you heard? Thank you. Um, Checkers Taxi would play a role as any other brokerage would. Uh, we're not looking for exclusive rights or anything. We are, um, with our history in accessible transportation in the back, we've always been an advocate and champion for uh, an inclusive design system. Uh, and we hope the city um, felt the same way in 2014. Uh, the complaints process that we brought up during our presentation, uh, we spoke about technology briefly and um, what some of these requirements that we suggest are. Uh, currently, they, all those go to tribunal and it's difficult to find drivers that match the vehicles or I'm not sure how the complaint process is fully worked out now, but what we would do is we would have um, technology that you could rate your trip, uh, technology for uh, that tells people where to pick up and drop off from. Uh, so it, 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 it's more data-driven, uh, kind of bringing to the taxi industry up to uh, today's technology is what we're hoping to see. And once everything's logged and you have all the right information, then you could possibly go to tribunals, track information, place complaints against operators. Uh, and that's still something we could always work out with uh, stakeholders, committee members, and, uh, and MLS, absolutely. Uh, your third question was who we met with. Absolutely. So uh, we sat down with Parkinson Canada. They were a very big, um, they, they believe strongly that something is needed and they felt that we are along the right tracks. Uh, they want to see how this evolves and how they could participate. Uh, I believe we spoke with uh, the Ontario Association for the, Bl uh, the Blind. Um, we spoke briefly with uh, Spinal Cord Injury Ontario. Uh, they were interested in our proposal we have to the province uh, in regards to different licensing standards. Um, that includes um, ride sharing services and taxi services to make uh, training at a certain level. Uh, we met with uh, Councillor Wong Tam's office. We met with uh, MLS and the executive chair, Carlton Grant, uh, and, and there's, there's, there's others that we spoke to. Uh, did I see a question over on this side somewhere? I lost track of the hand. Okay. Uh, so Michael McNeely and, and then Miranda. I, um, I appreciate your proposal. I just wanted to emphasize two points. Um, firstly, I would like to see more emphasis on the training of drivers because I feel that the drivers may not necessarily have an understanding of how to be inclusive towards all uh, people with disabilities. And secondly, um, I wanted to ask you in your proposal, what kind of um, accommodations have you provided for deaf individuals specifically? Because we can talk about physical accessibility, which is very important, but if I as a deaf person struggle with booking a cab, then it defeats the whole purpose of um, getting a cab in the first place. Thank you. Um, training is absolutely one of the major topics we spoke with all our consultation mem uh, all our consultations. Uh, it included sensitive sensitivity training, securement training. Uh, the City of Toronto and MLS has created a great framework in their 2014 training. It was um, world renowned. Um, we're looking to build off that with stakeholders. We're actually creating a steering committee with uh, different organizations and advocacy groups, uh, mainly because this helps us create a, uh, a more inclusive, uh, a more, sorry, a more inclusive uh, training program uh, that's given to us by the community and a more of a grassroots approach. And um, in terms of uh, non-physical uh, disabilities, 
Uh, we, we are very much pushing technology. This will help riders with not only hearing um, issues or visual issues, but cognitive issues as well, uh, or assistance. So uh, again, but we are reaching out to different uh, sectors to give us feedback. Uh, we are, again, working with a grassroots approach. We're looking for feedback. Uh, if this motion were to pass and the city were to adapt these uh, recommendations, we are looking uh, from feedback rather than working with uh, what we have or relying on the internet. Hi. And Miranda, sorry. Um, you spoke a little bit about the short-term um, funding, um, and I was just wondering if there was any thoughts on long-term um, options for sustainability? Uh, absolutely. Uh, this was one of the issues that we uh, spoke about in our presentation uh, with uh, the stakeholders. Uh, the long-term approach we're looking, again, is for creating or generating business for these operators. And so right now the city collects the accessible fund from ride sharing services. And what we're asking is for uh, in, uh, the driver get paid the meter fare, but that fare to be reduced by a certain percentage from the accessibility fund. This is gonna be a more cost effective service for riders and riders will usually go with what's more cost effective generating more business for the operators. And we're hoping that with this extra revenue, people will make the, or it'll incentivize operators to go from their sedans now and follow um, what, I, what, I, what we see as the city's um, steps towards accessible transportation, on-demand accessible transportation. Thank you very much. I, it, are there further questions? By the way, uh, for committee members, if you have questions that are more for th the city staff, um, that we have people here from municipal licensing and standards uh, who can answer questions that relate. Yes, Wendy. Sorry, Glenn, I have a question for municipal licensing staff, if possible. Is that possible? Uh, yes. Okay. Right now, if you'd like. Right now, okay. So, uh, I didn't realize that we had municipal licensing staff here, so my apologies for not mentioning. I didn't either till a few minutes ago. Okay. Um, I, I wonder if municipal licensing staff could tell us a bit more about the practicalities of implementing this proposed structure. So what, are, what would be the next steps? Any staff that can speak? Uh, so through the chair, um, with respect to implementing these ideas, um, that was part of the consultation process. Okay, so update um, through the chair. <clears throat> we can present the ideas through the GGLC committee. It's not something that we're anticipating at this time, um, but that's something that we're prepared to do. We are preparing a report specifically on um, accessibility and, and vulnerability um, that's going to GGLC June 24th meeting. So that is coming forward. Um, but uh, certainly we can consider um, the presenter's ideas. Thank you for your answer and thank you, Wendy, for the question. Do we have further questions uh, to this? Uh, seeing none, I would uh, like to move that we pass the chair's report with these addenda. Receive. Uh, sorry, to receive this item, yes, um, as read and with the information that we've now heard. I'm not sure how to do this, so I'm just going to put it out there. I, I would like to suggest a motion on this item that would involve the recommendation that city staff investigate this as a possibility and report back to the committee. So who should I talk to about doing that? Forward it. You forward it. I forwarded it? Okay, I forward that motion to the committee. 
receive it and forward it. City staff are going to work on this at the moment and we'll get back to it. Okay, that's great. If we could then pass the chair's report as, no? Oh, we'll hold, we'll hold the item down then and move to the next. Okay, okay sorry. Thank you. Don't know procedures perfectly well. Thank Me you for your either. understanding. So we're all getting there, thank you. Okay, at this time also, we do have a proposed addendum item and I would like if, if Councillor Fletcher would uh, read the letter, if you have that with you. And we have to get permission from the committee to add this in, but um, I would like Paula Fletcher to read the letter just to make sure that we know what we're talking about. And while Councillor Fletcher is getting that up, I would also like to remind people that we are working toward a 1230, a hard and fast deadline to be out of here because there is a flag raising shortly thereafter for Pride Month. Thank you. No, okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me here this morning. I just wanted to give everybody a brief update on something that's happening. This is the letter to the committee. It's to Councillor uh, Wong Tam, but as we know, she's very busy this morning with a tiny new baby. This is to Councillor Christian, Councillor, Councillor Christian Wong Tam, Chair, Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, Toronto City Hall, 100 Queen Street West, Re Accessibility and Dog Off-Leash Areas. Dear Chair and members of the Accessibility Advisory Committee, one of my constituents who is visually impaired and uses a cane took a serious fall while using the dog off-leash DOLA at Greenwood Park. My constituent was understandably hesitant to use the Idola and was then given a ticket by the city for having her dog off leash in the park. This unfortunate incident brought to my attention the need for a review of accessibility standards for dog off leash areas in city parks. The Rick Hansen Foundation describes pea gravel surface as inaccessible and calls for them to be replaced in place surfaces. A 2005 Safe Kids Canada report notes pea gravel surfaces can be hard to walk on and cannot be used with wheelchairs or other mobility aids. I also have a constituent using the same dog park who is in a wheelchair and he does not feel that the concrete strip along the south side of the fence gives him the access he needs. In April, City Council approved a plan to redo the DOLA with artificial turf, bringing it in line with accessibility standards from other cities. I am sure this issue goes beyond Greenwood and impacts resident and DOLAs across Toronto. As you are a citizen group giving advice to Council, I wanted to bring this matter to your attention. I am sure you will be interested in the outcome of the renewed surface of the dog park. So that is simply what I wanted to bring to the committee today. There is an accessibility committee in the parks department, but it's not a public committee. You are, that's put together by staff. You are put together as citizens who give advice. And this has been a simmering issue for a long time. Um, my great constituent was taken to court, but they let her off. She didn't have to pay the fine. I testified on her behalf about this situation. And this then really pushed this forward to look at how people who have accessibility issues are able to bring their animals, their pets, their companions into dog parks like any other citizen. So this I'm sure will be happening. I know they would like to come and speak to you. I just didn't know if this was appropriate at this committee or not. So I'll be guided by you, Mr. Chair, and you're doing a very good job this morning being thrown in to that role. Thank you. And uh, I certainly um, am thankful that you brought this forward to us, Councillor Fletcher. Um, it's certainly an important issue, and as you mentioned, it is something that the specialization um, is with Parks and Rec, of course. Um, but um, is, the, uh, is the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee um, in favour of having a brief discussion of this and perhaps with a motion to the effect that we support 
the idea of this and that, that we forward the recommendation for action to the City Parks and Rec. Is there anybody um, in favor? of, in, like to put a motion in favor, sorry. First of all, we need to officially add it to the agenda. Who's in favor of that? All in favor? Okay. I'm sure he was in spirit. Okay, having so moved, um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Councillor Fletcher, or, um, or questions that may be addressed to somebody who I believe may be able to speak to that. We do have a Parks and Rec um, accessibility person here today. Jason? Yes, thank you. Uh, Councillor, so we've heard that it, um, this initiative has been undertaken at Greenwood Park. Uh, is there currently a plan to have this um, also implemented in other parks? Uh, in, if so, uh, do we know what parks that would be? And if not, um, how do we uh, implement a study to see what parks would be the most appropriate for uh, this artificial turf? Thanks. Um, not that I'm an expert on dog parks, but I did chair the original People, Dogs and Parks Committee, which set up dog parks in the City of Toronto. This is just currently at Greenwood. It has been very hard to move the needle on this. And um, there has been, I believe, that Parks and Rec are going to be reviewing their accessibility uh, standards and their surfaces because pea gravel is currently the standard. It is currently the city standard. And um, I have a concern that it being the standard, it's in quite a few dog parks and that means it's not accessible. There are other surfaces such as the crushed gravel which are accessible because it's hard or grass surfaces. But this one is particularly unstable uh, my constituent did fall and break her cane, actually, in the dog park. And as I mentioned, my other constituent can't actually get onto the surface. So this would be number one. And I believe that Parks needs to review this very quickly and in a determined way and involve uh, citizen members of uh, committees such as yourselves in selecting and redoing dog parks that require that. I don't know if that answered your question. Number one is Greenwood. It's been heavy lifting to get it, and I have to pay for it all out of my own parks money. Um, the staff are very resistant to shifting over. It's not been used in Toronto before. It is used in Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Vancouver. It's used in very many other cities. It's never been tested in Toronto. So there's a bit of a hesitancy, just for your information. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher, and thank you, Jason, for the question. Um, if uh, I believe we have a question from Michael. Go ahead, Michael. I am um, not sure if I'm doing this properly, but I think we should make a motion so that um, a sign could be placed at the parks warning about some of the accessibility or inaccessible features of the park, saying that the gravel could cause a fall or could cause damage. Um, and we could also post that on our websites of the parks as well, to sort of give an accessibility guide. Let me get back to you on that, Michael. So, uh, Okay, if we do that, um, we, and if we do want to have a motion on that, we need to um, hold the item for now while city staff write out uh, an official version of that motion. And we could do so. Um, are we in favor of that at the moment? Uh, can I see by raising hands? Perfect, thank you. May I, add, may I add one other thing? That there are current accessibility guidelines in dog parks but they are essentially a strip of concrete 
that doesn't go all the way around, it simply goes along the side of the fence, which I noted in my letter. So I don't think they're very robust and certainly need to be reviewed. I know that there is a committee at Parks and Rec, but I feel like you are the committee that answers to city council. The other committee answers to staff, and that's why I'm here this morning to explain to you what's happening, and I thank you very much for your strong support. I think you're having strong support. Yes, seeing. Thank you, we appreciate that, Councillor Fletcher. And I see uh, Jason with a second question. Thank you. Uh, while we're on um, the idea of, of motions, uh, is it possible to make a motion to encourage city staff to study this issue and to see if it's feasible to be implemented in other parks uh, and uh, I guess just to have it studied and have it moved forward? Um, certainly that is possible to do. Um, let me just confer one moment and I'll get back to you with something a little more solid. Yes, we can do that. Um, we could put that with the earlier motion for city staff to work on right now. We'll put this um, item on hold just for the moment and come back to it when that, is, that proposed motion is ready for us to speak to. Does that work for you, Jason? Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Seeing none, and since we do have to put this on hold anyway, uh, motion to put on hold and proceed to the next item. All right, so we are on to the Thank next. everyone for hearing me this morning. Appreciate it very much. Now I'm going to be going back to my office. Thank you. Oops, thank you again, Councillor Fletcher. The next item is DI 2.2, Accessibility Feedback on Preparing the City of Toronto for Automated Vehicles. And at this time, I'll turn it over uh, to Shagita um, to get set up, and uh, we'll uh, wait for you at that time. Meanwhile, now is the time for awkward banter. You're all ready? Excellent. You can proceed anytime. Great. So thank you, everyone, for having me today. Uh, my name is Shigethi Devendra, and as mentioned, I'm a project lead on automated vehicles with transportation services. And really, my main project during this time has been uh, focusing on a strategic plan around this technology and its um, introduction. So what I'm really going to be doing today is sort of giving you a background on what our plan's intention is and giving you a, an option for further feedback, more detailed comment in the future. Um, so to start off, um, and um, uh, through our presentation that was sent earlier, um, we do provide a disclaimer. The City of Toronto does not have an official policy or position around automated vehicles as of yet. Uh, so all of the views and opinions create, uh, included here are of staff opinion. Um, but just to provide an update on our work to date, um, so most of the research around automated vehicles has been staff discussions and strategizing. Uh, we have an interdivisional working group on automated vehicles. That's been our main forum for a discussion. A few members are here today, so thank you for joining us. Um, but uh, it really started when City Council gave us direction in 2016 to research the impacts of this technology, to make sure the city was prepared for this technology. Uh, so for two years, our group was working on this. And as of 2018, uh, January, we went back to committee, so the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, and eventually City Council, um, where we took them a report with our updates based on our research, mm -hmm. and they came back to us with a few additional requests. Uh, so included in that report, we had a framework for a strategic plan, what we're now calling the Automated Vehicles Tactical Plan. Um, and they asked us to come back with something a bit more comprehensive, which we're aiming to do in fall of this year. So we are planning to go back to committee in, uh, we believe, October, um, with a more detailed and comprehensive plan. Uh, so 
a very basic introduction to what automated vehicles are. So many people know of autonomous vehicles, so cars that are completely driverless can essentially uh, get anywhere on their own, but there are actually five different levels of automation. Low levels are already on our roads today. Uh, level one and two is our uh, lane keeping, uh, blind spot detection, uh, some of the basic features in vehicles. Uh, level three is when we begin to let go of the driver control and the car can really uh, drive in certain capacities uh, on its own, but there is still a requirement of full driver involvement. Um, a piece of interest is the, pro uh, the province of Ontario actually has legislation around autonomous and automated vehicles already. Uh, so they are allowing uh, driverless testing on our roads, so uh, without a driver in the vehicle whatsoever. And level three will be commercially available uh, as well. So if car companies are able to sell this type of technology, uh, the general public will be able to buy it. So the city is really just ensuring that we're speaking to the correct stakeholders, voicing our concerns, and also preparing for any opportunities um, and uh, regu regulations and uh, sort of strategic policies that we need to put in place to introduce this technology in a way that works best for us. Uh, so a bit of background on our working group. We have about 31 divisions involved right now. We have everyone from public health to environment and energy who's seen an impact from this technology um, and have really been working uh, throughout the year with us on uh, sh showing how their operations may be impacted. Uh, so it's really been a collaborative effort on bringing together uh, each of the perspectives of these divisions to focus on what we need to for the specific plan. Um, so our tactical plan uh, is actually based on a foundation of our existing strategic policies. So we started off by looking at our uh, existing plan. So we looked at Vision Zero, the Equity, Diversity and Human Rights Plan, the Senior Strategy, the Official Plan, um, and we really tried to identify any policies that um, may be impacted by automated vehicles and also, also identify any gaps that we may have where we need to supplement certain documents with additional policy. Um, so this is all to say that uh, none of our plan is meant to supersede what's already out there. We really just wanna make sure that anything that needs to be added is done through this tactical plan. Um, we're at the point now where we've actually done quite a bit of consultation. I actually see a few familiar faces from our workshops in March of last year. So we really first reached out to stakeholders in March 2018. Um, we held nine workshops where they were all able to provide their opinions on automated vehicles and what they'd like to see. And we it was focused on community association. So we had various advocacy groups uh, that were able to attend and provide their perspective. And that's really how we created the actions for our plan. Uh, we've also had extensive industry, public, and staff consultation. Um, so it's it's been uh, built through what we've heard, really, uh, most of our plan. Um, so a few of the stakeholders that attended our workshop that may be relevant to the committee today, we invited uh, the Alliance for Equity for Equality for Blind Canadians, uh, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, uh, the Learning Disabilities Association of Toronto, the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, the Canadian Council of the Blind, uh, the City of Toronto's Disability Issues Committee. So we had, I think, about 20, 17 organizations that were invited and 11 were in attendance. So we wanted to ensure that we had all of these perspectives involved. Um, to provide a bit of background on really the structure of the plan, there are about four different levels at this point. Um, so on slide nine right, right now. Um, so the highest level, um, a very high level strategic sort of um, focus is our direction. So the one I've included on slide nine is on social equity and health. And you'll see the statement there is the city of Toronto will encourage the adoption of driving automation systems, which is essentially automated vehicles, in a manner that improves social equity and health. So we have about seven directions that are like this that are extremely high level, but set out sort of our focus. Um, and then below that, we have a 2050 goal. So this isn't to say that we're trying to apply these goals in 2050. We wanna make sure when we have a high uh, amount of these vehicles on our roads, that all of our actions are hopefully achieved to a manner that we're happy with. Uh, so what we've included here is um, one of our goals, which is ensuring barrier-free access. And the statement is, in 2050, the city will have harnessed the widespread adoption of AVs, or automated vehicles, to ensure all users have barrier-free access to personal mobility services. So this is really our goal for, as it relates to social equity and health. 
The more, most important, I think, part of the plan are the actions below this, which we're calling tactics. And this is really how we hope to achieve those 2050 goals. So we have about, I think, 70 to 80 tactics at this point, and they vary, again, from equity to environment to um, road safety. Um, the one we've included here is access for individuals with disabilities. So we do state that we want to develop and implement a policy to ensure that shared automated vehicle fleet companies provide an appropriate level of barrier-free access and ensure that unnecessary limitations are avoided. Uh, so what we will say is that these tactics are included, but we're spending the next three years investigating what some of these things could look like. Um, so for, uh, although we have a direction and specific actions we'd like to take, we have an iter iterative process below that to really fo uh, form what our solutions will be. So the very last level is our sort of three-year horizon for these actions, and they vary from uh, researching to implementing a solution to maintaining it. So we know there are different timelines in some of our actions, and we're trying to take that into account as well based on what our variety of divisions are currently working on. So on slide 10, this is just a high level introduction to what our seven directions, our 10 areas of research and the goals below it are. So I'll just quickly go through the high level directions. Uh, we have social equity and health, where we speak to barrier free access, mobility, equity, and promoting health. Uh, we have environmental sustainability, so oftentimes with automated vehicles, electric vehicles are in the same discussion, so we are trying to bring them together through this plan. Uh, our third direction is economic sustainability, so looking, of course, at innovation, expanding employment opportunities, um, expanding sectors related to automated vehicles. Um, is sort of that third focus. Our fourth is privacy. So uh, data protection, uh, data security is a, is a huge issue around this technology. So we've uh, dedicated a section to this and we've worked with our information and technology division to ensure that we're uh, trying to get s uh, mechanisms in place prior to a uh, high spread of this technology. Our fifth is road safety and security. It's really highly built off of vis Vision Zero. Uh, so preventing collisions, looking at our emergency response, looking at our existing infrastructure um, is the focus there. Our sixth is integrated mobility. Um, so looking at automated vehicles and how they can help improve our transportation system as it currently works. Uh, there's a concern that as this technology becomes more popular, that there will be increased congestion, that there may be more single occupant drivers on our roads, and we really want to push our transit focus that we have as a city. We want to push our existing shared modes, um, ensure that we're focusing on the ways that can move the most people in the most efficient manner. And our very last direction is uh, transportation system efficiency on slide 11. Uh, speaks to some of the same aspects as the one before this, but it's uh, about looking at managing system demand as well. Um, so those are the seven high-level directions. We also have three additional sections that spo speak to more of our internal operations, our um, future uh, proofing, looking at additional research we may need to do. So those three sections are our public service vehicles, additional research and future proofing and governance, so how we're really going to manage this plan. So our next few slides uh, really just speak to some of the tactics that could be relevant to this committee today. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, I've included our social equity and health tactics. And uh, the five tactics that are relevant that we've included are access for individuals with disabilities, access to transit for individuals with disabilities. Uh, we also have actually three other, uh, three additional tactics in here. So access for unbanked individuals, access for low income individuals, and then access for non-anglophones. So looking at the variety, uh, the various means of access that we really need to address. Uh, we also have increasing mobility equity under this. So uh, we speak to equitable service coverage, equitable performance standards, and mobility neutrality. So really ensuring we have equity in the way people move. Um, and the very last tactic I've included here is uh, healthy mobility. So Toronto Public Health has been a, a great support in a lot of our work as well. And uh, they're actively looking at what some of the impacts to health will be. So we've incorporated that into our plan as well. On slide 14, uh, we have our road safety and security uh, tactics. Uh, so we speak to the transition to AVs as it relates to transit. So really looking at some of the dedicated lanes that we may ha need with transit and automated automated transit vehicles, ensuring that the transition is smooth uh, as we see a mix of the various methods of travel. And then we also have a tactic on vulnerable road users. And then uh, again, AV integration uh, as it relates to transit speaks to a lot of 
uh, the same aspects of the one before it. Um, under our integrated mobility direction on slide 15, uh, we have four relevant tactics. So transit priority, active transit, transportation priority, transit-centric mobility as a service, and microtransit. Um, we do have detailed sort of actions on each of these. I know my high-level descriptions don't provide too much detail, um, but uh, based on the time we, we have here, we wanted to make sure we introduce you to some of the areas that may be relevant to you. As I mentioned earlier, we do have an opportunity for more detailed comment where you can speak to um, exactly what your, your group, what you'd be interested in. And then our very last section that I've included here is our transportation system efficiency and public service vehicles. So again, we speak to some of our incentives around transit and our AV fleet as well. So um, if trans automation is introduced into transit vehicles, how we're really addressing um, all of the needs of our uh, citizens through that. Um, so my very last slide before I take questions is uh, slide 17, and we really just wanted to provide next steps. Uh, so we've posted our most updated draft of the tactical plan report as of yesterday um, for public comment. And um, this is not high level at all like I've included. It's very detailed. We speak to the breakdown of the plan in more detail. We also provide some background on each of the tactics, so what the intention is, um, what some of the research shows, um, what our next steps are for the next three years. Um, so it's available on our website, uh, www.toronto.ca uh, backslash automated dash vehicles, which we're also happy to send uh, to the committee to uh, share if that's easier. We also have PDFs that we can share as well uh, via email. Um, so we have an ex ex accessible format and we have a graphically designed format as well. Um, so you're able to provide comment in any method that's easiest for you. Um, we're taking emails, Word documents, um, comments directly on the PDFs. Um, and you're able, you're, you'll be able to provide your detailed feedback, which we'll incorporate into the very final version of our plan, which we're hoping to take to committee in October. Um, so committee consideration should be at, public, at our new Infrastructure and Environment Committee on October 17th. And then from there, we'll see if we need to go to City Council as well. Thank you, Shagitya. Um, are there any questions from the members of the committee at this time? Jason. Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation. A couple of questions I think are somewhat related. You mentioned, I think, that it's either stage three or level three uh, of the project would mean that vehicles would be totally autonomous but would require some driver intervention. Are you able to elaborate on that? And then have you envisioned how, during the transition, automated vehicles would share the road with vehicles with drivers and how that would be managed. It seems to me it could be quite chaotic. So I'm just wondering what kind of uh, procedures you might have in place for that. Thank you. Yeah, so you've raised, raised two very great points. I didn't articulate the levels as clearly as I should have. So level three, I think, is the city's biggest concern. Uh, you begin to see higher levels of automation, but uh, it's really a matter of, it's kind of like the Teslas that are out there right now, where they can uh, drive by themselves uh, for a limited period of time, but that does not mean the driver should be lax, should not be fully aware. Uh, but many people are treating it as a completely autonomous vehicle. And you don't get to complete autonomy until you're at level four or five. Uh, level four is um, sort of uh, closed into specific geographic environments. Level five, level five will be able to learn any environment it's in. So that's sort of the differentiation between those two highest levels. But you only get to full, complete autonomy at level four and five. Uh, with level three, um, the drivers should be completely in control. So we're really looking as a city to ensure that there's public education around these low, this level that's often mistreated, um, that people are aware of how they should be uh, dealing with this technology. Um, and we're also speaking to the province, uh, trying to raise our concerns so that they're aware of um, some of the issues that we as a municipality may have as well. And uh, to your second point, um, you're exactly right. It would be completely chaotic with a mix of highly autonomous uh, mid like low level autonomy and uh, no auton uh, like no autonomy whatsoever uh, so this is where we're looking to the transition to avs um, so we have a few tactics around this uh, we're envisioning that perhaps in the near term it may be that these um, higher levels of technology are segregated to certain areas they may be a geographic area they may be a specific lane um, but as we begin to 
uh, have all of these vehicles transition over. Uh, a lot of companies are already looking into fully autonomous vehicles, so we think there will be a major shift. Um, we envision that they'll be able to deal with those le low levels of automations and no, uh, no automation whatsoever. So we're really just trying to get the policy in place to prepare for that. Thank you very much. I believe Wendy was next. Thank you for your presentation. It's really interesting stuff. Uh, I have a question and then when we come to comments, I have a comment as well. Could you speak a little bit more about what barrier-free access means in terms of the user interface of the vehicles themselves for people with disabilities? So generally what we see is that systems are developed and uh, the, the making accessible of the interface comes much later. So is this something that is being considered in the early development phases or is it something that will also be retrofit? So this is where some of our uh, work um, has limitations. Um, so we're doing our best as a municipality to uh, get ahead of the policy and uh, get ahead of um, uh, what we what is within our jurisdiction as a city. So what we can control, which is our transit vehicles, um, which is um, um, sort of the way the roads are shaped, the way the infrastructure communicates with these vehicles. Um, but the technology in and of itself is uh, is coming from the companies. So what we're doing our best to do is uh, have those relationships and um, go to these meetings, have these consultations, voice what we're hoping to see. Um, but in terms of the user interface, um, it'll the technology will essentially be up to the industry. It'll be a matter of what we allow within our city and what we can control there that we'll be focusing on. Okay, thank you. I saw Michael, but then Liv, I'll get to you right after that, if that's fine. Hey, I was gonna say thank you. As Wendy said, a very fascinating presentation. I wonder if this is maybe a bit on the premature side, but I'm just thinking about like say city services, like say wheel trans, for example, or paramedics. You know, is that something down the road where we're going to see fully autonomous wheel trans vehicles or fully autonomous paramedic vehicles? Um, so I, I think that's exactly the sort of thing, uh, aspects that we're looking at right now. So uh, what we've heard from our emergency services is that um, this technology could be helpful if these vehicles are able to detect other cars um, and uh, emergency service vehicles coming down the road and are able to split the road so that they're able to go through, that this is sort of a, a positive impact. So we're working actively to sort of communicate with industry that we'd love to learn what we can do and what we what we can communicate here. Uh, with wheel trends, um, I, I don't think there's been any detailed discussion on what the future of that is. We recognize that our operators are a, a big part of um, how our transit moves forward. So I think at this point, we're really looking into um, the opportunities to sort of improve our existing services. Um, we don't see that anything will be completely uh, replaced at this point with fully autonomous vehicles within our city fleet, um, but again, a supplement to what is already there. Okay, thank you. Thanks, and now Liv, Liv sorry. Hi, uh, so we've had some presentations around um, non-autonomous vehicles and safety for um, pedestrians, cyclists, other vehicles. Um, and one of the things that has emerged is that um, planning doesn't always into take into account non-typical users. So people walking or riding or rolling at a different speed, people who need different access points and different curb cuts, all sorts of um, pieces. And obviously we uh, discovered that the city doesn't track um, the number of people with disabilities specifically who are injured. Um, in uh, traffic incidents and um, uh, and 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 such. So, um, my question is around the technology and around what the city will allow. Um, uh, my sense is that the technology is designed around typical averages in terms of um, patterns of traffic use and that sort of thing. How will we ensure that? Uh, people who are using the roads, uh, particularly pedestrians, um, and people using uh, mobility devices aren't endangered by um, vehicles which are designed for, for sort of typical users. So this is uh, really where we look into uh, our existing standards as a city and what we can, again, control. So uh, when it comes to our fleet vehicles and our transit vehicles and ensuring that we can put the technology in place where it detects um, 
our variety of Torontonians and the way that it should. That's sort of the policy that we're putting in now so that the city can begin to consider it. Um, a lot of uh, the way the rest of the technology is placed is um, we've been looking at our, our maintenance of our infrastructure. So the way that our, our road signs are and the way that the the paint on our roads are included. That sort of improves the way that this technology can uh, go through our traffic system, which will in turn result in increased safety. Um, I think a lot of the messaging around automated vehicles is that it, it improves safety altogether, which it will not always be the case, especially in the early stages. So we're definitely taking um, everything that's been said with a grain of salt and ensuring that um, despite what the province is allowing, if we see these higher levels of automation that within the city of Toronto, um, all of our uh, our standards, our regulations, our policies sort of uh, speak to some of the issues that you've raised. So I think a lot of the concern is that we are definitely ahead of where the technology's at. Um, people expected those high levels to be here a lot sooner than they are right now. Uh, so the benefit is that we get to begin investigating some of these concerns and uh, begin, begin to put our voice into what the industry's already looking into um, the disadvantage is that we still need to wait to see what some of these problems are and how we can sort of uh, integrate it. So um, I, one thing I should mention is our plan is meant to be a flexible document. We're hoping to look at it again every three years and sort of update it based on where the technology is at, where the needs of the city are at. Um, so that'll be something we actively look into um, moving forward. Thank you. Any further questions of the speaker? Uh, yes, Darren. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, you had spoken to the need for a public education campaign, and I'm just wondering if any consideration or thought has been put towards that and what that would entail. So uh, we think there's public education at sort of various levels. Uh, there's education around the safety of these vehicles. Uh, there's education to our um, sort of drivers within the city, the staff that are uh, dealing with vehicles themselves. Um, there's also a lot of education needed uh, simply around what automated vehicles are. Um, so. Um, Again, based on our operations within the city, we're trying to see where we can uh, integrate sort of, sort of those mechanisms from the start. So if a person's riding in an automated vehicle that's controlled by the city, for example, there should be sort of uh, education around that. Uh, as we get to level three and we're, some of those concerns that uh, may be raised, we want to actively be educating around that as well. Um, thankfully, the province is already looking into sort of driver's education and what those impacts may be. Um, uh, one thing we do know is uh, we think we need to work with sort of nonprofits, industry, staff in the education process because we're only a fraction of what's happening with this technology. So it's definitely something that we need to be uh, working with all of the players within Toronto and the region. And and Ontario as a whole on. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions for the speaker, do we have any for staff? Okay, seeing none, uh, I know, Wendy, you wanted to speak to the item. Thank you again. Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, I'm pretty new to this idea of automated vehicles, as I think everybody is, frankly. Um, but I, I want to uh, just highlight a concern I have, and it relates to my question. So um, if we don't have some way of defining barrier-free uh, as being connected to the user interface of the vehicles themselves, then what we're going to see, I think, potentially, is a development of a set of vehicles that aspire to be barrier-free, but they are vehicles that cannot be operated by people with disabilities. So an example of this might be, for example, if you think about the internet, right? So the internet sort of grew and it grew quite quickly um, because we didn't really have the foresight to think about uh, the technology that people with disabilities were using or would have to use to access the internet. Uh, it just sort of happened and then we had to go back and develop the W3C guidelines to make the internet available in a way that people who use technologies or have disabilities can access. What I can see happening here is that the aspirations around barrier-free would be in uh, great jeopardy if we have a suite of automated vehicles that still require people with disabilities to have either a third-party piece of technology or a human intermediary to function in. 
So I wonder if I could just encourage you and city staff associated with the project to use the influence that you have as representatives of the biggest city in the country uh, to work into the kinds of um, discussions that you're having that the interfaces of the vehicles have to be usable by people with a range of disabilities or you will not meet a barrier-free uh, aspiration. So that's, that's it for me, thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Any further comments from the committee? Okay, seeing none, may I have a motion to receive this item? Uh, I see Liv, um, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Next item is item DI 2.3. One moment. I love paper. I've got it here somewhere. Okay, here we go, yes. All right, so for this, I'm going to turn it over to Deirdre Boyle for her presentation. My apologies for losing my paperwork momentarily. Okay, good morning, everyone. And congratulations to Councillor Wong Tam. Um, I'm Deirdre Boyle, I'm one of the accessibility consultants. And um, giving you this update for two reasons. Really, I know many of you are new members and I just sort of give a summary of the work that we're doing. And also to get some input from the committee on um, guidelines as we move forward with the multi-year accessibility plan. So who are we? Um, Briefly, we are a new division. We are part of a new division called People, Equity, and Human Rights. This division uh, was established in January of this year, and we are an integration of, uh, we now work in the same division as what uh, was formerly Human Resources. So this has provided an opportunity for us and put us in a very, uh, I think, opportunity in, in a good place that we work, we can work very closely with our colleagues in Human Resources. Our executive director is Alma Akintan, who was the previous uh, director for equity, diversity, and human rights. So we are still equity, diversity, and human rights, but we are no longer an uh, independent division. We are part of PEHR. However, our mandate remains the same. We're essentially advisors to city staff, to the 44 divisions of the city, and um, we provide advice and support to staff. That's our, our primary role. So our mandate hasn't changed despite the, the change in, 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 in reporting and so on. Our director is Wahida Rahman White. She could not be here today because she is celebrating Eid, but sends her regards to the committee and looks forward to meeting you at a future meeting if you haven't already met her. And so that's where the accessibility team lives. So we live, we, we work here at City Hall. Um, there are two accessibility consultants, Ian Brown and myself, and Mark Kim, who is helping me with my slides, is our project manager. So that is the accessibility team, although I would say that there are um, leads throughout the city who also in, we, 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 we rely on to support the work, such as Lorene Bodium here, who's with us from Parks, Forestry and Recreation, who does a lot of work in that division, and there are many, uh, we have many allies throughout the, 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 throughout the city. Um, within our office, there's also an equity and diversity unit, as well as a human rights office, and that, that makes up our team. We also work very closely with the Indigenous Affairs Office, who share an office space with us, as well as the con Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit, which is not in our division, but is in uh, social development, finance, and administration. Okay, so what do we do? So now I'm just gonna talk about the accessibility team and our work, and uh, we've tried to um, bundle our work into a couple different buckets. The first one is accessibility guidance and support. So we provide regular advice every day to city divisions, and staff on best practices, on understanding what their obligations are under the legislation, and how to do things better. Um, so that's a huge piece of our work. We also do um, interact with members of the public, uh, less so, but we do, um, we're not involved in the accommodation process in any way, but we may um, advise uh, members of the public who are looking for some support and maybe pointing them in the right direction. Um, and connecting them with the right people and helping them understand uh, 
the services that the city has. And then the next, the next bucket is awareness, training, and capacity building. And here I've included Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee because uh, I, I, I see this committee as really important for us as we guide and as we advise uh, the city divisions. A lot of that comes from, from you. So that is a big piece. We established an employee disability network uh, recently on December 3rd, 2018. Um, and that has been quite successful. Um, we also work with an interdivisional staff team, so about 150 city staff come together about six times a year, and they're representatives from all of the divisions, and this is where we share information, share best practices, share uh, council directives, anything related to access and equity, and it's not necessarily disability specific, but certainly these are some of our champions. Um, last week, in um, to celebrate Accessibility Week, we had a forum for staff um, that was really quite successful. We had two keynote speakers. We had members from the Employee Disability Network speak to senior leaders. It was um, very well attended and uh, I, I think an indication of the momentum that is happening at the city. And we also had the Toronto for All campaign and um, that uh, Canadian uh, SILT, <laughs> Centre for Independent Living Toronto, led, worked with our colleagues in another division, Social Development, Finance and Administration, and partnered on that campaign. So that's an example where we don't necessarily have a lot of um, external programming, but we would advise our colleagues in other divisions on um, you know, some of the messaging and the approaches and best practices. And finally, the, the third bucket is compliance monitoring and reporting. So this also takes a lot of our work is, is in how do we collect, you know, from 44 divisions, over 35,000 staff, um, coordinating our reports, making sure we have a report due to the province this December. So, you know, how do we, working to ensure that we are reporting confidently, accurately, and honestly. Um, that's a big piece. And then we are also right now working on the Toronto Accessibility Design Guidelines. They are very close to completion. They are, we are really working out now the policy side and how they will be implemented. And you will um, hear more about those in the coming, coming meetings. Uh, we also uh, led uh, the, the development and implementation of the City of Toronto accessibility policy that was adopted by council last year and many uh, and this committee had provided input on that and last but not least uh, we are working on the multi-year accessibility plan so that's what we're going to spend the rest of my time talking about so the, the multi-year accessibility plan is the city's strategy to identify prevent and remove barriers um, it, is, it applies to city divisions, but it does not apply to agencies and corporations. So for example, the police have their own multi-year accessibility plan and they do their own reporting to the province. Likewise, the TTC has their own plan and does the reporting. And that's for, and as you know, um, the terms of reference for TAC really, it is really linked to our work on this, um, on our accessibility planning. And so that's why TTC issues are, are we often will refer to ACAT and appreciate the chair of ACAT, uh, the Advisory Committee on Accessible Transit, for being here today. Um, the previous, uh, our my app, we call it, was really based on AODA compliance, the Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation. It was really just, you know, here's the, the regulation, do we meet it, yes, no. But this update is really an opportunity to um, make it a little more uh, robust. Um, it's an uh, opportunity to develop, to, to, to figure out how we can go beyond compliance with, with minimum standards. Uh, we are working through the content with our partner divisions, with all the divisions currently, and we held consultations in 2017. Um, another thing we want to consider as we move forward in our planning is looking at, um, many of you know David Onley's uh, third legislative review of the AODA 
um, had many recommendations and while those recommendations were really um, directed at the province, there are some things that we, I think, as a city can learn from and take those learnings and incorporate. Um, for example, three that I think we can incorporate in our multi-year accessibility plan is ensuring public money is not spent uh, to create or perpetuate barriers, um, leading by example as a government, and um, fostering cultural change both internally and, and externally. So where we're heading. So the new plan will continue to be structured around the integrated accessibility standards place, standards regulation, but really as a starting place. Um, we want to go beyond the minimum compliance and we want to have measurable goals and we want to add guiding principles and that's really what I want to talk to you today about. Um, and also to, the plan will also highlight the important role of TAC as we move forward on this journey. So the structure here is going to look a lot like previous versions and this would, what I have on the screen would look like um, a table of contents. So it would start off with an introduction. This is where we would provide the legislative framework, the policy framework, um, the commitment of city council and, and the city manager and then the guiding principles, which we'll get to in a moment, and then the different sections uh, would, will include the general accessibility initiatives, those that are um, multi-service area, things like procurement that really cut across all divisions and all service areas and how do we ensure those processes are accessible. We will have um, information and communication. We work closely with a digital accessibility team in information and technology division. Um, employment, uh, transportation, um, the, 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 de the design of public spaces, this will really focus again on, the, on how do we implement TAG, uh, the Toronto Accessibility Design Guidelines, how will we, um, how will we use them and, 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 so, and, and how will we enforce the use, those kinds of things. Um, and then customer service, an example is we're working on updating customer service guide, we're going to be working on guidelines, we have a guide to good practice which is for staff and we're looking to update those as a few examples. I could spend a lot of time on this but I, I want to really focus on the guidelines so we'll keep going. So the structure of the sections, um, really it's about what identifying what we want to, want, want to achieve, what we think we can achieve and, and how we're going to do that and the outcomes and timelines. So just as an example, um, a priority could be, you know, the city will foster cultural change within the Toronto Public Service um, to, to encourage inclusion and awareness. And then, you know, an activity for that would be um, in, how do we embed access, an accessibility lens in all of the training, all employee training, um, and maybe a, a, a learning strategy for employees. And then the outcomes would be, you know, looking at the training results, you know, the targets, um, you know, what, what, is, what has been, where we've gotten 80% of staff have taken this training and so on. Those would be some of the, not the only measures, but things that we can measure. And the guiding principles. So I thought that this was an, because the, the multi-year accessibility plan is essentially going to be a living document. As priorities of council often change, um, resources change, funding changes. So some of the um, some of the sections of the plan may be updated regularly as these things change. But the guiding principles, I think, are an area where your input is really important because these are the things that will not change. These will be the foundation, the building blocks to our plan. So if a staff is working on a project and maybe the details of that project or what dis what they need to do isn't laid out in the plan if they if they can go to these guidelines uh, these these principles and have that help them make their decision you know which, which if i go with, depending on which way which which way which path is more aligned with these principles so i think these are really important piece and I, as I go through them, I would ask that you, you know, think about is this, do they reflect what the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee would want to see in our plan? And if there are 
if there's some things missing, if they're, you know, if they speak to you, if, if, if they don't, I, I'm really welcome feedback on this. Um, so I, I have highlighted here the AODA principles. They, were, they are also an integral part of the plan, but I won't get into details, but they are dignity, independence, integration, and equal opportunity. And then the four additional uh, guiding principles that we're suggesting is accessibility by design, leadership, innovation and adaptability, and collaboration and engagement. So just going to go into each one a little bit more and to show you where we're thinking. And just um, in, in where these came from, they came from looking at many other documents and principles and guiding principle documents. They also um, came from looking at some of the feedback that we received in 2017 and also um, some of the messaging I've heard we've heard from this committee as well. So accessibility by design, this really means that it's not a check box, it's something that is going to be integrated into our planning, into all of the things we design from every stage. So um, it's not an afterthought, it's, it's, it's something that's all along the process of any project, any planning activity. Um, we also, yeah, people with disabilities will not be an afterthought, so that it, it will be built in. and. Um, accessibility and accommodation work together and what I mean by this is that our goal will to be to create permanent inclusive solutions but we also have to recognize that we also need to have an accommodation process that is accessible and inclusive and, and easy to navigate and that the more inclusive we be build the less individual accommodations we will be um, will be necessary, but we will also always have to have that and, and have them work in harmony. And um, we know that there, with, there is no one size fits all, so we will also always have, have that. Um. And then the social model approach, um, really this comes from looking at, uh, thinking a way, how do we approach disability? And a lot of times we are, you know, we still see a medical approach in some of the accommodation processes and sometimes that's necessary. But overall, we really want to look at how we can change the environment and, and, and looking at not, not thinking about accessibility and disability as an individual health condition, but really thinking about how we can, the problem and the barrier is what what is the problem and the environment needs to change. So. Um, I won't say more about that, but that's, that, I think that's integral uh, piece of it for, for us. Okay, and then the next one is leadership. Um, we want the City of Toronto to be a leader and lead by example, and our motto, diversity our strength, um, speaks to that. And I think it was Wendy Porch at, in the Toronto for All campaign, I saw quoted as saying something like, a, a city, people with, a Toronto that includes people with disabilities is a stronger Toronto. I don't know if I said, saying that except exactly, but I think that's, that's sort of the sentiment here. Um, and that's also included in our workplace culture. Um, we have a workplace culture framework that the city manager is working on, and one of the pillars is diversity and inclusion. And so this is um, really important um, for our culture. Um, again, maximum accessibility, not minimum compliance. And finally, just this accountability that the senior leadership across the city, that senior leaders will be a, a, accountable um, for, for creating accessible environments in their areas of responsibility. Okay, and then innovation and adaptability, it's pretty straightforward, again, there isn't a one size fits all, so we need to acknowledge that and be open to new approaches and trying, uh, finding new solutions, um, responsive to new technologies as, as they change. Um, we want to foster cultural change, as I mentioned earlier, and that's including perceptions, attitudes, and behaviors. And finally, collaboration and engagement. And this is really about, you know, ensuring that everyone's voice counts, ensuring, understanding that 
accessibility um, in the Toronto Public Service is not just the responsibility of the accessibility team. It's really, uh, we need a collaborative approach to make this work. We need to work with all of our staff across the city and as well as residents and also, uh, and also councillors. Um, and, and so there's also an importance placed on, on engagement and community consultation with this committee but also with other communities and other stakeholders. So that's what I have. Um, really welcome feedback, would really love to hear um, about what you think of those principles and if they uh, reflect something that this committee would, would support in our moving forward. I'm done. Thank you, Deirdre. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor? I see Wendy's hand first and then Michael. Thanks, Deidre. I wanted to just ask a clarification question. So the AODA principles that you had in there, including dignity and independence, and then the, the um, MIAP principles that you're proposing as well, are, you, are they uh, cumulative? Are they all together? So the proposed principles to guide this would include all of those principles, or is it the second half that you're including? I think, I mean, at this stage, uh, we're early draft stage, I think we, I would definitely want all of them to be included. Um, so I think that they would all be important. But um, I started with AODA, but that didn't quite, with what was in the AODA, didn't quite um, think that that covered everything we needed. So. If the, if the suggestion is maybe to, to, to include all of them as equally important, that, that would be taken. Thank you, and uh, Michael, I believe, has a question as well. And then uh, other Michael. Okay, hi, thank you, Deidre, for that uh, presentation. Um, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for talking about the National Accessibility Week from last week. That's important to acknowledge that. Um, I was just wondering a couple of things. Was that um, event that you had, was that just for staff or was that also for the public? And sort of when you were talking about sort of having sort of, I guess, greater visibility, I mean, for example, for today for Pride, we're having flag raising. Uh, for the seniors event, there's a seniors event. And I'm just wondering, is that something, and maybe I can bring that up as a motion later, is maybe, you know, to have that visibility and to sort of show senior leadership maybe having a sort of city-run or city-led event, either in conjunction with National Accessibility Week or for, you know, for the International Day for People with Disabilities to sort of, sort of highlight what the city is doing. So that's kind of a roundabout way of asking. Okay, uh, thank you for that. I, so the forum itself was just for city staff, senior city staff. Um, I, the point is taken um, about the request for more visibility. In, in terms of our work on our, our small team, our, our focus is um, as advisors to city divisions and city staff, but that's not to say that that um, visibility isn't needed. And thank you for that. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but as with the Toronto for All campaign, although we advised on it, we weren't necessarily the leading division. event for people with disabilities. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Deirdre, for your answer. And we have one more question. Hi, so I'm just wondering um, if we're talking about the core position of different committees or subcommittees within this structure, when we're looking at a um, a ratio of people with disabilities versus people without disabilities. Like I said, that the AODA has such a ratio. So are we going to do more on that than that ratio that was already suggested? Thank you very much. Um, we have a late request um, for a speaker to this item from the floor. Um, Miguel Avala would like to speak to this and I need a vote from the committee to, uh, to allow for that. Yeah, 
the vote would be on whether yes or no to hear from him. Yes, Jason. Thank you, um, Miguel. Um, you're welcome to present at this time then. accommodations. My name is Miguel Avila. I've been coming to City Hall for the last 10 years. My teacher says disability will never stop me, only discrimination. So last December the 5th, uh, 2018, uh, Security Corporate, Corporate Security, sorry, implemented a new enhancing services on the third floor of City Council. Has anybody been here at third floor City Council? No. Okay. When you go to the third floor city council, there is a metal detector and a screen with a magic wand. They search your pockets, they ask, they ask you to empty everything. So it's like a second level of screening compared to the one in the, in the main lobby where you are asked to search your bag. On, this, on the third floor, what happened is you had to empty all your pockets, any metal things that you have with you. And then when they're satisfied with searching your pockets or everything, they let you in into city council and to enjoy city council meetings, which I've been doing for the last 10 years. So again, um, I have two disabilities, one invisible and one visible disabilities. The one that is physical requires me to go to the washroom many times because I have diabetes. So it's not my fault that I had to get up from the city council chambers and go to the washroom. Now what happened on December the 5th is the following. And this is a true story. I was asked after finishing using the washroom, the toilet, to get screened out again. And this happens three times during the day. I had to get myself screened like anybody, nobody else except me because I have a disability. So I want to bring this matter to your attention all. It's a true story. Until today, the issue has not been resolved by corporate security in order to make accommodations for Miguel Avila and all the members who have disabilities. So members of the committee, I want to encourage you to make some changes in order to accommodate the needs of people with disabilities who come to City Hall, and particularly people with, who have come for the last 10 years like myself, and I feel discriminated by the way they are being asked me to Every time I go to use the washroom, I had to get screened out again, which is very demeaning. It offends me. It makes me feel second-class citizen. So members of this committee, I want, to, I want you to show me your leadership and make changes for the, for the better um, um, use of the facilities for everybody, not just people like us, but everybody else. Thank you so much, because this is our home. This is our home we make decisions for everybody to, to improve our society. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Miguel. Thank you. I want to thank you for presenting that. It's something very important to you, and I respect that very much. Um, do members have any questions for the speaker at this time? Uh, Michael. Okay, there we go, thank you. Uh, I was just gonna make a quick comment. I've noticed that same thing as well, where if I've come in from one entrance and I say go to the other side to the library, I've gotta get screened again as well. And I'm just wondering, and I don't know if this is a motion, but maybe there needs to be some sort of um, workaround solution where there's like say a wristband or a hand stamp. So if somebody's gone through security once, they get a hand stamp or a wristband so they don't have to keep going multiple times. I'm wondering if that's the solution. I think it may be something that's beyond what we can talk about at length without some discussion and information and input from city staff, obviously. But I, I think it's certainly something that needs to be thought about. 
and uh, Miranda. Yes, thank you. Just to add to Michael, um, a suggestion, um, possibly a visitor pass for people that come regularly, even for uh, committee members, because I can also speak to that, that I've often been stopped many times just to even get into this room here. So um, I think it is something that does need to be addressed somehow. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. As somebody who has experienced the same, I would agree. And I know it's always a fine line, you know, between security and accessibility. And we need to find, I think, perhaps sometimes a different balance than what we're experiencing at the moment. Thanks. Um, back to the item at hand. Do we have an, uh, the original item at hand, which was Deirdre's report? Um, I will save further comment for the rest, if that's OK. Um, do we have any further questions of staff about Deirdre's report? Seeing none, uh, could we, uh, do we have anybody who needs to speak to the initial item? All right, seeing none, uh, would someone like to move that we receive that report for information? I see both Michael and Darren at the same time, um, so uh, Darren. Can we have a vote in favor? Thank you, carried. Our next item is DI 2.4, Accessibility Feedback on Official Plan Review in regard to transportation. So if we could turn it over now to Michael Hain. And thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm Michael Hain, I'm a senior planner in the in city planning in the transportation planning policy and modeling unit i'm leading the transportation component of the official plan review and my purpose for being here today is to tell you a bit about that review and hopefully get your feedback about some of the the measures that we're proposing to address accessibility among other things uh, so i'll quickly start out by giving a bit of background about the review and then go through the policy areas that we're reviewing one by one, talk a bit about what our, our steps going forward from here are at the end. So to start with, uh, every municipality in Ontario is required to have an official plan. It's a requirement of the Planning Act. It's also a requirement of the Planning Act to review the official plan every five years. So this is the process that we're going through now. Uh, the particular review that the city is going through now was split into different topic areas transportation being one of them. Uh, the transportation component started in 2013 and we're in a second phase of the review now. The official plan sets out at a high level what the city is trying to achieve, largely from a physical perspective, um, but there are some policies that address uh, programs around the physical aspects of the city that are complementary to the physical aspects. It doesn't describe specific steps by which you would achieve the vision that's described in the plan, uh, but high-level policies that provide a framework for that. The official plan in the City of Toronto is written as a quite integrated document. There isn't a specific section for transportation to gather all of the transportation policies. You do have to read the whole document. The, the bulk of the policies are contained in sections 2.2 and 2.4, however. So if you want a, a relatively good perspective of the city's transportation policies, you can stick to just those two sections. The, the key objectives of the transportation policies in the plan are threefold. The first is to maintain the existing network, and that's really a state of good repair issue making sure that every element of the, the network functions at a high level so that everyone can make use of it. The second is to improve the existing network. So we, we heard through our consultation many times that there are concerns about the quality of the transit network. So this is one example where it is an aspect of the city's transportation system that we're trying to improve. The third aspect is to expand new networks. So this is largely linked to things like the cycling network that are relatively new and not well developed, but you could uh, potentially see in the future new technologies that may require networks of their own. So as I mentioned earlier, the transportation component of the review started in 2013. 
We passed a first phase of the review in 2014, uh, just prior to the mayoral election, and it covered a few different sections of policy, uh, but there were policies that were left behind. Since 2014, a number of things have happened. Uh, I should have said earlier that the official plan is just one element of the city's overall policy framework. There are many other guidelines, policies, plans, and other documents that complete the policy framework. And, and the policy framework is constantly evolving. So since 2014, many other pieces of work have happened that have contributed to the policy framework and continue to happen now. Uh, so although we are focused on a relatively small section of transportation policy at the city now, uh, we're always happy to receive feedback on any section because it's quite likely that there is something going on in the city that's relevant to any other aspect of policy. We resumed the official plan review in 2018 uh, and started public consultations on this phase of the review earlier this year. So the, the four policy, uh, the four main policy sections that we're looking at this time around are transit, cycling, updates to map three and schedules one and two, which are technically the, the parts of the official plan that describe right-of-way widths within the city. And since 2014, automated vehicles, ride sharing, and emerging technologies like that have become more of an issue. So we've added that as a fourth area of policy review. We're also uh, incidentally looking at things like water, wastewater, and stormwater transportation. Um, and the main reason for me being here today is that we're trying to uh, refresh the way that we look at accessibility in the official plan. So from a transit, a transit perspective, we had a few uh, key objectives when we moved into the official plan review about what we were trying to achieve here. The first was really that we wanted to provide more guidance for how the city should make decisions about how it expands its rapid transit network. And so in this direction, we've added a number of policies that lay out a framework by which you would make decisions in that area. We're also uh, expanding our language on the state of good repair. Currently, the official plan only speaks to state of good repair from a transit perspective. We want to broaden that to speak to all aspects of the transportation system. And we're also strengthening language around network connectivity, levels of transit service, and we're adding a new section to address public realm issues around new higher order transit stations. Uh, I wanted to highlight on this point that the the official plan lays out in its vision and goals fairly strong statements about achieving equitable access or universal accessibility of the transportation system, but this language isn't carried very well through the actual policies. So to address this, we're proposing to add accessible as a descriptor for one of the key objectives of the regional trans transportation system. We're also adding uh, language um, to the state of good repair section to, to address some of these accessibility issues. With respect to cycling, uh, the key objective here was to provide a, an overarching goal for the cycling network for the city. The official plan doesn't currently have one. And the goal that we're trying to achieve um, or introducing is to bring every area of the city within one kilometer of a dedicated cycling facility. Uh, the policies will also be strengthened to improve the language related to the convenience or attractiveness of the cycling network, and also to improve language around safety. Uh, the policy uh, is trying to recognize that road safety is everyone's responsibility and not uh, the sole responsibility of individual users. Uh, for automated vehicles and shared mobility, as you heard earlier from Shigithia, this is a, an area of key interest to the city. Unfortunately, it's still relatively early in the development of the technology, so it's difficult to say much concrete about it. Uh, that being said, we are introducing policy to try and address some of the issues that are already clear, that there is a, a rise in pickup and drop-off activity as a result of some of these emerging technologies, and we'd like these sorts of activities to be accommodated. The updates to MAP 3 and Schedules 1 and 2 are really more of a, a bookkeeping sort of exercise. We weren't proposing any new changes here. We were uh, recognizing changes that had already been endorsed by council in some way, either through the endorsement of an environmental assessment, a transportation master plan, or other policy document. So these are typically relatively small and local changes. We aren't proposing uh, anything new or citywide. So moving on to uh, accessibility, this is the area that I'm, I would be very grateful to get feedback on what we're proposing. 
Uh, right now, the official plan uses terms like access, accessible, or accessibility in at least three different ways, and it, it's, it can be quite confusing as you read the policy to interpret which of the meanings uh, is intended. Uh, the first meaning is the, the one that gets associated with the Access for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, that everyone, regardless of uh, whatever uh, personal aspects they have, that they're able to access uh, city services and every area of the city. The second is more of a, a technical use of the term within the transportation planning field that's used as a measure of the, um, the, use, the usefulness of the transportation system and your ability to get to particular destinations. And we're proposing to make this clearly distinct from other uses of accessibility by always using the modifier transportation before accessibility. And then the third sense of the word is just the, the more colloquial sense that some people are able to get to a place. Uh, and where possible, we're trying to eliminate the use of this more colloquial sense so that it doesn't get confused with the more technical senses. So within the, the slide deck that was hopefully circulated to all of you, on slide 10, there was a, a draft policy there um, that speaks specifically to what we're hoping to achieve with the transportation network with respect to accessibility. Um, and I, I'd be very happy to get feedback on this policy. We've uh, been continually evolving the policy, so our current draft isn't quite what was circulated in the slide deck. On sub-policy B, we said that transit stations and facilities would become accessible over time. We're planning to delete the words over time. Uh, sub-policy D that speaks to encouraging vehicles for hire to be accessible. We're trying to strengthen that policy and we're working with MLS right now to, to come up with final language for that policy. Um, but I, I'm quite happy to receive feedback on any of those policies. Going forward, uh, we're planning to report to Planning and Housing Committee in July with our recommended official plan amendment. Uh, in order to satisfy the requirements of the Planning Act under Section 26, we have to make the recommended official plan amendment publicly available on June 12th. So we will do that. Um, an accessible version will be posted to our website and a hard copy will be available in City Hall. Uh, if everything goes well, uh, Council will be approving the official plan amendment in the July cycle. The approval authority for OPAs under Section 26 is the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, uh, and they get 210 days to review the, the OPA. So if the review goes smoothly, uh, these policies would be enforced by approximately February of next year. I should also note that under Section 26, there isn't an opportunity to appeal. So if you would like your feedback incorporated into the update, uh, it would be best to get it to me as soon as possible, or you can speak to uh, your counselor. Uh, I, I really appreciate you having me here today, and thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Michael, as well. Um, for the committee members, do we have any questions? I see a hand. Uh, Wendy. Thanks for the presentation. Can I just note, it would be helpful to have the presentation on the screen uh, throughout the course of the presentation. For the, I have it on my laptop, but for some folks who don't, I think it would be helpful to see it, Agreed. particularly as we're discussing a, the policy area that's proposed, right? So you have a draft policy on slide 10 that I think what you're asking for us is, clear, is input on that, the particular language of that policy, is that correct? That's correct. I'm quite happy to get feedback on any policies, but I wanted to highlight that one in particular. Could I ask that we have the, the slide put up on the screen over here so that folks on the committee could actually look at the policy text because I think that this is a great, a very important opportunity and I, would, I think it would be helpful to have that on the slide. Okay. Looks like that's being worked on at the moment. Um, meanwhile, uh, Michael, do you have a question? Yes, um, I think I just had a suggestion um, well, this is that I think people will use Couture and find to search the document to find out what is most pertinent to them. So I would just recommend that access and accessibility only be used in relation to people with disabilities and um, any other term could be used for the other kinds of things that that could be an easy way to read through the document. 
Thank you, Michael. I guess that was more a comment than a question. I don't think there's anything, there's nothing really for him to answer, is that right? No, it was just a comment. Thank you, no, just clarifying. Any other comments? Liv. Um, can you speak to the intention behind uh, removing the overtime clause on, um, on the second uh, piece there on your slide? Uh, we didn't want to suggest that this should take a long period of time. It's um, a, an issue that's quite important to the city, and uh, we would like to, to make it happen as quickly as possible. Is there, um, is it beyond your scope to suggest a timeline? It is beyond my scope to do that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? I see a follow-up, Wendy. Um, then uh, Jason after Wendy. I should have asked them all at the same time, my apologies. Um, can I ask, just in terms of the language that's up here uh, in your draft policy, so it says the transportation system will be developed to be inclusive of the needs of people of all ages, abilities, and means by, and then you have the range of options that you have here. It doesn't actually uh, aspire to developing an accessible transportation system. So is there any particular reason why it's being developed to be inclusive of the needs of people with disabilities without the actual aspiration of it being, having an accessible marker on it? Uh, there are other policies in the plan that say specifically accessible transit system. Um, this is, I guess, historical language that gets used in the official plan. Um, it's not intended to be anything less than saying an accessible transportation system, but it, if you feel that it does imply that in some way, then we're quite happy to change the language. Uh, Jason? Yes, thank you. Picking up on, on Wendy's point, um, I think it's it's very important, being this is going to be the, the, the plan going forward for the city to have the language as strong as possible and, and more mandatory as opposed to permissive. So when you speak about encouraging ride for hire programs to become accessible, wouldn't a better word be uh, mandating or uh, something along those lines? Well, I, I'm completely on board with making the policy as strong as possible, and that's what we're working with MLS to achieve. Um, the current version of, the most recent version of the language that we're still working to tweak is introducing measures to ensure equitable access to vehicles for hire. Um, I feel that it's quite a bit stronger than the, the version that's included in the slide deck. Um, oh, okay, so the, vers the version of the slide deck is not the one you're going with? No, we're, we're okay. definitely working to strengthen that one. Um, the version that I read out is our current draft. Um, if you need me to read it again, I, I'd, If you wouldn't I'd, mind, yeah, this is the one you're going to be, the one that's, the current one that's on the table. Yep. That'd be great, thanks. Introducing measures to ensure equitable access to vehicles for hire. Okay, yeah, the one you had read earlier was encouraged. I think ensure is somewhat stronger, yeah, thank you. Do you think that new language is strong enough? I, I'd like to see something like require or mandate, but I think it, the, it's better now than the first draft that you'd read in terms of it. I think it is stronger. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee, uh, including for staff or any further comments? Uh, yes, Michael. I'm just going to echo everyone's comment that I think the fact that we've got like ensuring, modifying, supplementing, encouraging, you know, we need to sort of have consistency in language though. And I, and I like Jason's point of having either mandated or required. It's much stronger that way. But even with what I find when I look at number E, requiring adequate crossing time, even, you know, from a definition point of view, how much time is adequate, for example. Um, you know, should there be a set amount of time or flexible time in, in that way? And Wendy. We're in the comments, right? Um, can, I, can I ask, uh, so we have text here before us in our slide deck that is not the current version that you're working from, right? So you're, you're asking the committee to provide you with specific wordsmithing uh, recommendations related to a draft policy that we don't have the current version of. And I'm finding that kind of problematic. So is there any way that you could provide the text of the current policy to uh, perhaps Deidre and, and the folks at your office, which could be 
disseminated to the committee and we could revisit this at some point. Um, I think that this committee is very interested in providing you with detailed feedback. It's hard to hear a policy and comment on it. It would be good to, in, in fact, for this particular committee to get the text uh, that you want us to provide the feedback on in advance to everybody, have it reflect the most current version, and then we would be in a better position to, to provide you with informed feedback. So the, the version of the policy that I provided was the most current as of the deadline for getting the slide deck to this committee. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's a, a very live policy discussion and it's just shifted in the, the two weeks since the deadline. Um, I'm, I recognize that that makes it challenging to comment and I'm sorry about that. Uh, next time we do a policy review, I will try to get to this committee much earlier in the process. Thank you for that. And if you are able to forward that revised version via Deirdre to, so the committee could read it, that would be amazing. Yep, I will do Thank that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, any further comments? Seeing none, could we have a motion to receive this? Uh, motion by Michael. Um, all in favor? Thank you. Okay, yeah. We are going to go back to the motions in regard to the dog parks. We now have a proposed um, wording for a motion. Um, and this motion, just to let you know, reflects both the input from Jason as well as from Michael combined into one motion. And the motion reads as follows. It's just to let you know officially that it's 2019.di2.7. Uh, that, that the item be referred to the general manager, parks, forestry, and recreation with the request to consider a study on the feasibility of implementing artificial turf or other solutions in all dog off-leash areas in Toronto to improve accessibility and consider signage at dog off-leash areas to, to indicate any inaccessible elements and any potential hazards and to post the information online and to provide an update to a future meeting of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, any comments on the motion as it stands? Darren. Um, I would just like to suggest that um, the word accessible be placed in front of signage so that there's a clear uh, distinction that that's what we're looking for. Okay, specifically in what spot? Um, sorry. Um, I think it was the second recommendation to provide signage in parks. Okay, there was uh, talking about inaccessible elements. That is in the wording. Accessible signage. Oh, accessible signage, okay. Ah, not just signage, but accessible, accessible yeah, signage. So just add the word accessible in front of signage. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I needed that clarification, but my mind's getting fuzzy. <laughs> Any further comments or questions about the proposed language? Um, seeing none, can we have a motion to um, adopt that with the added word accessible in front of signage. Um, so moved by Wendy Porch. All in favor? Motion carried, thank you. Uh, now we can go back to our items in, uh, whoops, not in order. Uh, this is, it, E, sorry, just need to read this before I go forward. Ah, yes, it's, it's the motion that was proposed in regard to municipal licensing and standards for accessible taxi brokerage. We now have a proposed uh, motion for that. And the proposal, which is 2019.di2.1, moved by Wendy Porch, is that. The executive director, municipal licensing and standards be requested to Consider the new designation of an accessible taxi brokerage outlined in the submission from Checker Taxi 
as part of the report to the General Government and Licensing Committee on June 24, 2019, and to provide an update to a future meeting of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Any questions for the wording as it stands at the moment? Uh, seeing none, do we have a motion to pass said? Oh, Wendy has already moved. Sorry, I guess we don't need to further move. We do need to vote. All in favor? Motion carried. Thank you very much. And now we move to the next item on the schedule, which is, or should be, uh, DI 2.5. Request for presentation to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee on the Poverty Reduction Strategy. And this comes in form of a letter from Michael Michelli. Michael, would you like to read the letter? Oh. Oh, everybody got it. So I hope everyone uh, was well behaved and did what they're supposed to and read it. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Michael in regard to his request? No, I see none. Um, would uh, Michael like to move on his recommendation? Michael so moves. Um, all in favor of his recommendation? Uh, motion carried. Uh, the next and now last item on the agenda is uh, DI 2.6, Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, Outstanding 2014 to 2018 agenda items. Again, this is a letter um, from Michael Michelli, and the highlights version is a request that at some point in this current year that um, the committee, sorry, that the city clerk staff, I guess it would be. Thank you, Michael. Um, having heard that, um, do committee members have any questions for Michael in this regard? I thought not. Um, all in favor of said motion? Oops, sorry. Pause. Sorry, Glenn. Uh, I have an additional motion that I would like to also propose okay. alongside this one. All right, so we have two motions then. Um, Let's hear Wendy's, um, and then we will um, vote uh, for the two different motions. Okay, go proceed, Wendy. Want me to read it? Yes, please. Okay, that the executive committee requests the executive director, people, equity, and human rights to provide the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee with an update on one item 2018.ex36.41, uh, Persons with Disabilities Employment Strategy, Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee Working Groups Update, considered by the Executive Committee on July 17, 2018, requesting the development of a Persons with Disabilities Employment Strategy with the purpose of ensuring that persons with disabilities are employed at the City of Toronto at a level reflective of their representation in the population of the city. Thank you, Wendy. Um, point of question, uh, one moment, I will get back to you. Um, since Michael's was presented first, um, let's vote on Michael's request and we will vote secondly on Wendy's if that's all right. Okay. Um, so let's begin uh, by that first and that is the executive committee requests the executive director, people, equity and human rights to do the following. Number one, provide the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee with an update on A, 2018.EX36.41. Uh, Persons with Disabilities Employment Strategy, Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee Working Group Update. B, 2018.EX30.28, Employment Accessibility at the City of Toronto. And number two, to include the following information in the update. A, the current representation rates of employees who self-disclose as having a disability within the City of Toronto workforce. And B, what the city is doing to better allow for self-disclosure by employees who have a disability. So beginning with that motion, um, Michael has already put it forward, so it doesn't need a mover. All in favor of said motion? 
Motion carries. Thank you very much. And now to Wendy's that we just saw and read. Um, Wendy has already moved it by into presenting it. Um, all in favor of Wendy's motion by show of hands. Thank you very much. That motion carries as well. So as a summary for that um, whole section, uh, DI 2.6, um, because the motion as we received it is very amended, we need to also pass a motion to accept the amended version. Adopt the, uh, the, adopt the item as amended. Um, who would like to move that we do so? I see multiple hands, uh, Liv, we'll go with you. And who would vote in favor of the of passing the item as amended. Done. All right. Uh, that, um, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of this meeting. Hallelujah. We're actually done early. That's incredible. Um, make sure, if you're able, to go to the flag raising ceremony um, outside. Uh, the time for that is 1230. So, we have oodles of time to grab washroom and or coffee and beverage breaks and be present for the beginning of Pride Month celebrations. Thank you again for putting up with my pauses and questions. And thank you to all the support staff who helped get me through this as well. Uh, can we give them an unofficial round of applause for that? Thanks. <laughs> Class dismissed. <laughs> Good job, Glenn. Good job, yes. Woo-woo! <laughs> <laughs>